On today's World Insight, today marks World Environment Day, and this year's theme is Beat Plastic Pollution. Is there enough global cooperation to tackle plastic pollution and climate change? Hello, I'm Tian Wei, and welcome to World Insight. We pay little attention to them. The plastic cup and straw of our favorite drink, the plastic bag from the store, and the plastic wrapping of our delivery. They are all small conveniences that contribute to the big problem of plastic pollution. Humanity produces over 430 million tons of plastic each year, two-thirds of which end up in the waste dumps. The very reason why plastic is convenient is its durability. That is exactly the same reason why plastic waste can change natural habitats and degrade and also ecosystems' ability to adapt to climate change. The buildup of plastic waste affects the livelihood of millions. But we could cut plastic waste by 80 percent before 2040 if better policies and tech market shifts are carried out, according to the United Nations Environmental Program. So this year's World Environment Day focuses on solutions to plastic pollution. Since 1973, World Environment Day has grown to be the largest global platform for green outreach. On the 50th anniversary of the World Environment Day, how can the global community better work together against the plastic waste? How can we help future generations to be free of plastic pollution? For more insights, let's talk to our panelists. Ian Durham, Jackson Owen from Duke University. In Newark, Salim Ali from the University of Delaware. And in Beijing, Zhang Jianyu from the BRI Green Development Institute. Thank you so much for joining us, gentlemen. So this year, we're focusing on plastics. Why is it so crucial? Go to Dr. Zhang. Well, I think plastic is, um, is important because it really sits in the middle, the intersection of uh, arguably the three major environmental crises that uh, we're facing, climate change, uh, pollution, and also degradation of biodiversity. So plastic, you know, certainly we find lots of those in the ocean that's related to the biodiversity. Uh, plastic, the uh, production process, and also is the recycling of plastic involves lots of uh, uh, pollution control measures. And also very importantly, the whole process of making plastic from fossil fuel goes mm. into the heart of climate change. Mr. Owen, um... There are so many directions that we are all working on in terms of protecting the environment. How to make sure that the resources are focused and the attention is focused to make things happen? I think that the most important levers on that front are to ensure that there are strong social and business opportunities that come from that environmental action. If we can create solid jobs and income opportunities, create kind of local environmental benefits like cleaner water and cleaner air, more abundant fisheries, better lifestyles for populations in both wealthy and poor countries, then you'll gain the requisite political support to solve the more global challenges like climate change. Mm. Professor Ali, at this point, we are seeing uh, not necessarily strict uh, government policies regarding the use of plastics but rather more focusing on ESG and also, uh, you know, ethical calls by the international community. How much can we achieve with this? Well, there is a recognition that we need to have an international effort, and that is why actually there has been a global effort to operationalize a treaty on plastics, uh, which was announced earlier this year. And in Paris, there have been meetings to try and work through the text of this treaty. So there has now reached that global consensus point that we need an international environmental legal mechanism to regulate plastic. Is it going to be too little too late, Mr. Owing? 
I think the great X factor with plastics specifically is what the future business model looks like for agents in the plastics industry. As we see a likely decline over time in demand for fossil fuels for transportation and traditional uses, there is a growing energy to steer many of those fossil fuels into greater production of plastics. If mm -hmm. there's not a strong alternative to the use of plastics uh, and a real effective push to alter consumer behavior, both from the bottom up and through regulations, so then it is likely, I think, that um, the plastics problem will only get more difficult. Mr. Zhang, agree? Yeah, and uh, also I think there's another level uh, that we probably should look at this is, uh, you know, to be very frank and honest, I don't think we have a realistic alternative to plastic right now. So that's always uh, uh, what people call the remaining 10% of the global emission. Even we replace all the uh, coal-fired power plants and also we replace all the cars with, uh, with EVs. And I think we need to accelerate that. And one way to accelerate that for a sector that we do not have a feasible technical solutions right now. Mm. I mean, people have been talking about green plastic uh, for a long time, but really we, we, we have not made uh, too much advances there. So I think we need to have a global treaty and some kind of a mandatory uh, in, in cap to force people and force the, uh, the scientists, the technicians and the practitioners to really come up uh, with solutions in order to solve a problem of this scale. Not only we need to have the new innovation technology, but also we need to have the manufacturing capabilities to significantly reduce the cost to have the alternative achieved. Professor Ali, while we are talking about lack of uh, enforcement and mandatory goals uh, for the international community on plastic, we are seeing, you know, advancement in technological developments elsewhere, very active. For example, artificial intelligence with the latest uh, GPT and etc. It seems that one after another uh, evolution, or shall we say revolution, are taking place. Why on the one front, like environment, the speed has been very slow in terms of, uh, you know, grand innovation. Well, on the other front, such as artificial intelligence, we are seeing in recent years, uh, several rounds of great revolution and this time likely to be transforming you know the future that uh, we are to work with uh, you know for human fundamentally to work with technologies how should we explain this how should we understand this yes yeah, so you're absolutely right that there's been this sort of parallel track of uh, efforts in areas like green chemistry uh, to try and innovate on materials and then separate innovations in the computational realm with artificial intelligence. But now we're seeing a convergence and artificial intelligence is now being applied to try and solve some of those molecular problems. So mm -hmm. using AI to actually find the kind of molecules which will be sustainable more so. So you're seeing mm -hmm. that's the, the, the real new frontier for green innovation. And mm -hmm. I remain very optimistic. You know, one of my roles is I serve on the United Nations International Resource Panel, uh, and we do a global outlook on resources. And uh, we are seeing that within the last five years, there's been a shift in the opportunities in, in material innovation that uh, we mm -hmm. would not have envisaged in the past. So I think mm -hmm. we will see within the next five to 10 years, massive strides in using AI, machine learning to, right. to uh, buy it green chemistry. Mm. So you are not, uh, you know, disappointed by the fact that, you know, in terms of environmental enforcement and also mandatory goals, we are not there. And yet in the other round, in terms of technological development, such as artificial intelligence, all countries are racing about the latest technology and applications of it. You know, I think that innovation in these kinds of areas sometimes takes spurts. It, it, it goes slowly sure. and then suddenly you have a paradigm shift. And I think we're very close to that point. Uh, and we have all the signals that that is likely to happen. For example, you know, in the last uh, five years, we had two Nobel Prizes that were given in chemistry that related to some of these innovations. One is CRISPR technology, which is looking at how you can have gene editing to create enzymes and other kinds of molecules which would be really useful in green transitions. The other was 
the work of Frances Arnold at Caltech, uh, which won her a Nobel Prize also, looking at some of those kinds of innovations and applying them. And uh, just that recognition and the, the amount of attention and funding that they are now going to get, uh, it gives me a lot of hope. All right, Mr. Wowing, do you agree with that? Yes, I agree with everything Professor Ali said, but I'll answer the question in a slightly different way, which is to say that there are elements of solving environmental challenges that, while they would certainly benefit from technological advancement, aren't necessarily being held back by that. They're being held back by the lack of an ability to create policy incentives that can stop business as usual behaviors. And sometimes it's not always clear how that those kinds of incentives can be easily put in place. For example, if you want to build a modern power grid uh, in a country with energy access problems, um, then that's going to require large expenditures of capital that that country may not have. And similarly, if you want to transition away from a fossil fuel-based industrialized society, you're facing pretty strong headwinds from vested mm -hmm. interests that already exist there. Uh, so in many instances, I think that it's going to be up to the policymakers, not just to create the regulations, but to try to create the incentives from which the private sector can move forward, not just mm. with new technological innovations, important though, though they are, but with being able to rapidly permit and build out the infrastructure that we're already able to create now. We just need to do more rapidly and at greater scales. Artificial intelligence, we're already seeing this huge digital divide in our world for decades. So um, it, it seems that the task is even harsher or more um, strenuous for the latter about the environment, isn't it, uh, Dr. Zhang? I don't think right now we have uh, all the right incentives in place to facilitate mm -hmm. the technological innovation to go to an area that with that degree of urgency. But what are the right incentives, as you said? Well, pricing signal. I think pricing signal is something really important, both in terms of giving people the motivations but also pricing signal is important to penalize people for their bad behaviors. And that we need to take into account, uh, for example, the durability and, and uh, persistency of the plastic, you know, how long they stay uh, in nature and how much damage they can do to us. But let me point to the other part of the uh, sort of comparison, shared comparison between technological innovation and also sort of uh, environmental stuff is actually, uh, I won't, I won't be, name it, but I have seen innovations have been sitting in lab for a long time that could uh, make a significant contribution to the environment social issues, but they mm -hmm. were hindered for a variety of reasons, economically and, uh, and, and sort of socially. So, uh, and, and whereas on the technical side, uh, because right now we'll have more decentralized innovation. So I think when we talk about policies and, and innovations, we also need to think about the overall sort of it's the social system, the capitalist system that we're in, that uh, whether uh, there's a problem there that we uh, need to create a more enabling environment for the solutions mm -hmm. of the social and uh, environmental problems to, uh, to emerge, uh, even though uh, they probably could have already been invented, but just sit in the lab. Uh, Professor Ali, I know you wrote a book about, uh, you know, how humans are related to the environment that we are in and how we are looking at it today. Tell me more about your thoughts of the current stage of people's uh, awareness and understanding. Political scientists have talked about notions of world order. You know, we often hear the term new world order. Uh, but in fact, what we need to be looking at is uh, an, uh, an earthly order which connects natural laws with political order. And that requires a very different kind of analytical process. It requires a confluence of science and policy making, which has been often absent because environmental issues have been low politics, you know, generally speaking. Environment yeah. ministries are not the ones people are always clamoring for, right? It's usually the finance ministry, the defense ministry, and so on, right? So how do we shift that? And we, we raise the bar. And I think that that's going to be the key point and, uh, and, and how we do that is going to be a generational struggle. Some mm -hmm. of it will require ecological literacy. The role of academia is really important in that. 
you know, we have all kinds of requirements in universities. We have diversity requirements. We have, you know, uh, other kinds of requirements which are important, but we have hardly any university has an ecological literacy requirement, which I think is really needed. After all, that's the fundamental life support system on which we all depend. Go to you, Mr. Yerwin. Uh, you are working on public policy really related to what Professor Ali has been talking about. Tell me more your thoughts about where we are in terms of our environmental literacy of the common citizens, the business world, and the politicians. In some wealthier countries, I think there is a, still a mindset that we can engineer our way out of many of the environmental challenges we face, both proximate, such as you know, building new infrastructure to protect us from rising waters, uh, to global when coming to geoengineering the global climate. Mm -hmm. I think those positions are foolish, and we're seeing the uh, negative repercussions of, of kind of depending to too great an extent on engineering at the expense of kind of ecological literacy and responding policies that Professor right. Ali mentions. In poor countries, they don't have the luxury of thinking of just simply engineering their way out of those challenges. Um, but oftentimes there, the connections are not always made to some of the global and en environmental changes and the, the industrial and human systems that are driving them. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, at, while at a policy level, those are certainly understood, I think that uh, at sometimes at a population level, um, there needs to be greater education that could drive de decision making mm -hmm. um, among the leaders of those countries, too. We see the environmental climate crisis is coinciding with uh, geopolitical tensions and economic uh, challenges at this point globally. So um, the earlier uh, consensus uh, has become a challenge uh, to be implemented uh, because people are seeing more the word of competition and even rivalry in mind rather than cooperation in mind. And yet we know it, the issue about environment is really to rally the crowd, everybody. Uh, so how do you see this uh, current reality compared to the aspirations people have, you know, two or three decades ago? 50 years has passed. I actually, I, when I, whenever I think about this, I'm pretty pessimistic. I don't think we have made too much advances uh, in terms of gathering the global consensus to uh, move on. I don't know whether you can see, but actually I wear a special shirt. It's a, it's a pie shirt, but it's with a timer uh, from the three bodies, Santi. And, and what it asks is that what's going what's to gonna happen at the end of the time? You know, this is the timer, it's the message sending from the Milky Way, informing mm -hmm. us that how much time they're going to have. I, I think mm -hmm. that is the kind of mood that we need to, uh, uh, we need to facilitate uh, in today's world. Everybody is talking about we're in an existential sort of threat, climate change, biodiversity, and pollution. But when we act ourselves, we act pretty much sort of independently and uh, and uh, self selfishly in terms of uh, in our behavior. I also see your title as the BRI Green Development Institute Executive Director. So here it comes to the emerging economies and developing countries as well, because the Belt and Road Initiative is pretty much economies uh, in the South working together. Of course, there are also many developed economies joining in over the years. But having said that, though, there were earlier media, quote unquote, reports about uh, the so-called lack of uh, uh, green awareness. Now, how much has been improved? What is the reality, Mr. Zhang? The gap between people's awareness and the reality that people are facing is really growing bigger. And, uh, and, and there's definitely that strong, stronger call of the greening uh, you know, from the developing countries and they really need cooperation. And that's really, I think uh, my institute uh, plays a role here that we follow what China's pledge to green the Belt and Road, uh, to make green as the background color, but also China's uh, really important uh, announcement in 2021 by President Xi that China will stop building coal-fired power plants overseas and also mm. committed to building 
green and low carbon energy system with the uh, with the developing countries. Uh, Mr. Owen, please also comment on the developing economies and also developed economies, their roles right now from your perspective. Certainly. I think right now we have a competition for infrastructure development from a few different players, all of which are seeking to be able to provide infrastructure effectively to developing countries where it's needed. Unfortunately, many of these packages fall short in a number of ways. One is that they don't have the capital required to build the systems that are needed for these countries to develop in a green way. They need to be able to bring in additional private sector funding on the back of them. So far, they've been relatively ineffective in doing so, and many of the large asset managers and pools of finance and private sector companies are reticent to get into countries where they see high risk profiles and poor investment environments. And if these kinds of entities can't coordinate, as my friend Jianyu has just suggested, then that's going to continue to be a problem. And I think in particular, we need to see progress on coordination between the US and China specifically. We would not have seen the Paris Agreement realized in the way that we did were it not for a series of bilateral agreements that had high level political support from President Xi and President Obama. And that really set the tone in Paris and Paris continues to guide our international climate and by extension, many environmental efforts to today. And mm -hmm. while we've had efforts to rekindle that at national and subnational levels, uh, I think that we really need to focus on that in the lead up to COP28 this year in trying to get the US and China to avoid spoilers to move past difficulties elsewhere in our relationships and to try to really, really emphasize climate as an area that's truly essential for cooperation. Is there a window opportunity in the coming up COP? Uh, as we know, U.S. Uh, is going to go into the election season, the year 2024. Uh, at this point, uh, China-U.S. relations has been described by the U.S. president as sawing, uh, but uh, with a uh, uh, quite uh, uh, measured steps uh, to say the most. Uh, so, Mr. Oin, once again, your thoughts. I do think there's a window of opportunity here for two reasons. One, there is an appetite to move beyond the truly fraught relationships that we've seen over the last couple of years in particular in both capitals on a high political level. But on a more granular level in the climate arena, we still have many of the same people in place that have negotiated and operated this partnership for years into the past. But the relationship still exists. There's commitment, I think, in the climate change communities in both countries to try to find ways to work together. Yeah. Um, what, what, what remains to be seen is if we can come to actually substantive bilateral agreements in which we're increasing our levels of ambition, in which we're promising greater levels of investment into clean energy systems in third party uh, developing countries, in which we're trying to find new ways to share technologies and create city to city partnerships. We need to be looking for those kinds of tangible outcomes um, and not just you know, kind of more vague diplomatic agreements to work together. Dr. Zhang? Yeah, I couldn't agree uh, with more. Uh, let's say even if for a variety of political and economic reasons, the two countries cannot work directly with each other, but they can probably find ways to work uh, together in the third country, in those developing nations uh, through initiatives. Before we go, we are celebrating the World Environment Day. Um, so one or two sentences from every one of you, despite of the fact we are in a challenging time, uh, what would be the positive message you want to share with our viewers? Uh, let's go to uh, Dr. Orwin first. I think that one of the great victories of the last 50 years is the increase in environmental awareness and prioritization. Despite all of the headwinds that we've been discussing, it's clear that environmental considerations are now at a higher level in boardrooms and in political apparatuses mm -hmm. and in international organizations and in diplomatic forums around the world. 
than they were in 1972, certainly, but also than they were in 2002 or in 2012. And so the increase in primacy that we're seeing in these issues, while hasn't fully bore all the fruit that we need it to, is important in its own right and is a positive sign for what might be possible in the future. Dr. Zhang? Well, I think we used to have two options, uh, uh, either to, in solving environmental problems, either self-destruction as the, the kind of war that you uh, described, or sustainable construction. Certainly, Elon uh, tried to create a third way, which is taking all of us to Mars, but I think that's probably not so feasible in the foreseeable future. So sustainable construction, I think, is still the only option that we have. Mm. And Professor Ali? Yes, well, you know, what gives me hope on World Environment Day is the adaptive and resilient spirit of humanity. And I, I come from Pakistan originally, a country which has endured devastating floods. Uh, we had our climate change minister argue at the last COP for an adaptation uh, mechanism and a fund for compensation of uh, loss and damage caused by extreme weather events. That led to a consensus towards such a process. And uh, that gives me hope that, that human beings, even in a country which has had so many challenges like Pakistan, are able to bounce back uh, that mm -hmm. doesn't mean we should be complacent, but it does give me hope. Gentlemen, what a pleasure talking to you on this uh, important day, World Environment Day. I hope we are as enthusiastic as we were five decades ago about this issue and probably even more in terms of actions as well. Thank you so much for joining us. That's our discussion on the World Environment Day. The World Environment Day started 50 years ago. I'm Tian Wei. For more information, you can find us on YouTube, Twitter, and Facebook. On behalf of my team of World Insight, thanks for watching. I'll see you next time.